Welcome to Scala Days 2015. So uh, we, we're here to hype you up a little bit before the crowd and Dick was telling me that there's two words that get programmers excited more than anything else. What are the two words? Turing complete. Woo! Come on. Come on. Ready? Let me try it again. Come on. Turing complete. All right. All right. All right. I think, I think, I think they're, they're excited. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. It wasn't loud enough. <laughs> We Should we try it again? Everyone? Ready? Turing complete! Yeah. All right. Oh yeah. That's better. I, I think they got it now. I, I, I think we're good. Uh, yeah, so welcome to Scala Days. We're your hosts. We're the Scala Wags. We have a podcast. Um, mostly we tell bad jokes and you'll get to experience that in full force right now. <laughs> Housekeeping. Housekeeping? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, did, oh, it's me, isn't it? I'm the jerk. So don't be a jerk, okay? That's the code of conduct for this. Uh, it ought to go without saying. I'd love to live in a world where it went without saying. Uh, sadly, we don't quite live in that world, but for the next three days, we do. Strangely enough, I've heard from many sources that nobody here is going to be a jerk for the entire time. That's outstanding news, I think. So there yeah. you go. Don't be a joke, please. If if you're curious on types of behavior that are not allowed, um, this what would be is, like what is being a jerk exactly? What is being a jerk? It's uh, like spitting on people, punching them. Yeah, that sort of thing. Hey, like oh yeah, that guy right this there. This guy yelling at, from the audience. That's definitely jerkish behavior. Heckling. I believe right it's there. called heckling. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. So if you guys have looked around, this place is kind of big. It's sort of like a bunch of big sort of like empty factory spaces. Um, and there's lots of st like, like big buildings that might not be the buildings you're supposed to be going into. So uh, everybody actually has a little map somewhere in here. It's one of these cards. There's a map. Um, and there's actually a bunch of space between each one of these big buildings. So if you're interested in the session, it's wise to look at your little map and to look at where your, your next session is supposed to be and to actually plan sufficient time to get to the next place. Uh, you might find yourself lost a few times between big warehouses. So you always have a map in case you're lost, just so you all know. Can everyone see my map from the back? Per person in the last row, can you see the map? Yeah. Woo! Good. All right, the Wi-Fi is uh, Scala Days 2015. Um, it does say that it only is available in this facility. That, that is not actually true. The Wi-Fi is available from all of the conference rooms. So you will have Wi-Fi. We know that this is a programming conference, guys, okay? <laughs> we got it. Uh, so now um, I think 47 Degrees is going to come up and sing a song for all of us. Yeah. No, um, no. 47 Degrees? I, I, I think you mean 98. That's uh, 98, 98 degrees. degrees. You got it wrong, man. What? You got it wrong. What? <laughs> is there actually somebody from 47 Degrees or 98 Degrees going to talk oh. about the app? Thanks, okay. guys. All right. Thanks. Uh, I'm Aaron Regan, VP of uh, Business Development for 47 Degrees. Uh, we're a certified type safe partner and global consulting firm. So. We, uh, we're happy to be here, first of all. Love Scala Days. So happy to also provide the official mobile apps again. So one thing we wanted to quickly mention this year that's different is uh, both of the apps are open sourced. So that also means that we uh, wrote the Android version in Scala. So uh, as developers, you guys can go in and find all the little bugs we might have left behind for you. and put in a pull request and we'll go ahead and get them added in. So um, we also have a table behind this huge curtain here. So we'd love you to stop by and say hi and look forward to meeting everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I also want to say if you haven't tried it yet, the, the app is completely available offline which is beautiful. So it's, uh, it's uh, better than a lot of conference apps that I have tried in the past. Oh. Just, just on that, I discovered today just by poking around that you can actually put the little check mark and have it added to your agenda. I didn't know it had that functionality. I'm probably the last person here that didn't know it did that, but I thought I'd mention it in case there's anyone slower than me. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, so there's going to be a lot going on this week. Um, just so you know, after this keynote, there will be food and drink here. Um, sessions start at 9 and end at 6. Um, tomorrow, there's a community party here at, in Fort Mason. Um, Wednesday. St. Patrick's Day, by the way. It is St. Patrick's Day. There's going to be some green. Yeah, so wear, wear your blue shirts in, in <laughs> honor of green. Um, Spill some beer on it, maybe it becomes green. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, also on um, Wednesday, there's going to be a Q&A with the Scala team afterwards like we did last year. So please come to that. Feel free to ask any question you want. It will be good times. Um, there's a meetup after that and on Thursday there's trainings, Thursday to Friday, uh, if you're interested in Hilton. Um, there's going to be an unconference from Nitro, but if you want to go to the unconference on Thursday, you need to sign up at their booth so they know how many people tentatively are coming. All right? So in this world of incredible awards like the Oscars and Lifetime Achievement Awards and Rock and Roll Awards, there's really only one that matters. And that is the Phil Bagwell Community, Scala Community Award. Just, you know somebody who's, who's won one of those, don't you? Yeah, I, I think I've met Lilith Plant once, and I'm pretty sure Bill Venner's got the first one, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the reason we're bringing this up now is uh, we haven't yet selected our Phil Bagwell recipient and in fact the, not only the voting but the nominations are still very wide open. So what we're going to do this year is we've got two Scala days. We're going to give the award in Amsterdam but we're seeking nominations now. So if you've got somebody you want to nominate, please tweet them to Scala days and we'll uh, co collate them and then uh, get a voting thing going. Yeah. So it's going to be very open and democratic. So people that you feel were just highly influential in Scala, welcoming, opening, opening. Uh, but they, uh, the other rule is they can't be from TypeSafe or EPFL. So, but other than that. Thank you all the speakers who, uh, you know, th this wouldn't be much of a conference if it was just nobody speaking. So thank you for everyone who put in. Uh, one thing I do want to say is we were on the selection committee, all of us. If you, if you, got, if you put in an a, a abstract, a, a, a proposal and it got rejected, just know that there were less than 10% that made it through. There yep. were a tr ton of uh, submissions. It was really hard going through them and picking the ones that we did pick. It was uh, in incredibly painstaking. So, you know, we feel bad that not everybody gets to talk at these things. We really made an effort to try and mix it up between the two, uh, uh, the two different Scala days. And if you didn't make it, I'm sorry, but we'll try again next time, I guess, and yep. uh, we'll try and try but and get you in. Thanks to all of them, because without them, there uh, there'd be no one trying to teach us. Um, Related to that, uh, there's a voting app. So, uh, actually, is it a part of the, the 47 Degrees app? Do you know? Uh, I don't Where know. I think there's, I don't know. there's people. Oh, that will yeah, have that's this. right. There's people standing at the exit. Okay, so and you press the after, button. You, after exiting a talk, um, we would really appreciate it if you pushed one of these pretty pictures. Um, and sort of what we're looking for is was the talk well done? Not necessarily, I don't agree with the talk or I didn't like that guy's hair or whatever. Only push the sad face if you think the talk was not very well done. Yeah, so the green actually means that it met your expectations or exceeded. Yellow is what you use for this was a kind of a shaky talk and red is definitely like this talk was not well delivered, not well planned, that sort of thing. Um, so please don't just red talk because you don't like someone's hair, right? We, uh, let's, let's, let's be, again, the code of conduct. Save that for something serious because we, we use this in feedback to pick speakers next year, okay? Uh, we want to thank all of you. Without this, there would not be a conference. You guys are what make this awesome. So thank you. We also want to thank our sponsors because our sponsors provide a lot of the ability for this conference to be even more awesome. They make things fun. I think that they've even contributed to some of these food and beverages and things like that. So thank you sponsors. You can meet most of them behind the curtain.
It's the, the we veil talk, of... Did we talk about blue shirts already? Uh, oh, yes. If you, if you have any questions throughout the conference, you need to look for someone with this blue shirt. Not, 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 this, not this one. Or but, Daniel Spiewak. Or, or Daniel Spiewak. Yeah, yeah Daniel Spiewak will also answer all questions on life, the universe, If you have need, life, any advice of any meaning, kind, everything. if you would like some help choosing a drink or something, you can always ask Daniel. Daniel, can you raise your hand? So everybody so knows. Right here. He's right, right over here. here. This man. He's going to ask some questions. All right. Yeah, I think you have to start. All right, so, so now comes the, the, the main event. Uh, and for that, we need to hand over the reins to our team language designer. Some say at the age of two, Martin Odersky had to invent a type system to learn the English language. I can't really say anything because EPFL has classified most information about him and he also has to sign my PhD diploma one of these days. So um, I can say though that he has the Turing Complete home entertainment system which some might find interesting. Turing Complete. <laughs> Turing Complete. And rumor has it that when starting on his latest project he named it after my dog Dotty. All we know is he's called Martin Odersky. <laughs> Oops, this looks dangerous. <laughs> Remember the first Scala days we had in Lausanne, I actually fell from the podium right at the beginning of my keynote because there was like here a gap between the screen and, uh, and the podium. So I'll, I'll stay right in front and be very wary to come go any closer. So I'm going to talk. Uh, Originally I thought the title of my talk would be the thing you see announced here, uh, Scala, where it came from, where it's going, but I decided uh, lately that uh, that's really not what I want to talk about. Uh, so I think I just talk about, uh, let me just see how this works. Uh, no, I don't get the, the clicker doesn't seem to be working yet. Oh. Uh, Dick, can you quickly co look? The, the clicker doesn't seem to be working here. That they put this on. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see whether. All right. Okay. Well, <laughs> that makes it interesting. No? Hmm. Maybe I should take my computer back. Hmm. Oh, that wasn't really planned that way. Ah, I think we better. Okay, cool. So uh, I wanted to say where it came from, where it's going, but now I decided to just talk about where it came from. Because after all, Scala isn't really going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> you know that there's this saying, uh, Scala is a gateway drug to Haskell. And I think we should recognize this fact and uh, for that reason we should really phase out the name Scala. It served its purpose and replace it with Haskellator. I give you Haskell. <laughs> Have a look at this very cleverly designed logo that in a beautiful way combines the Haskell and Scala logos. So uh, idea and design is by Sandro Stucki. Now seriously, um, where it came from, I'm going to talk a little bit about that but then we go to where it's going. So where it came from is that uh, essentially I'm a compiler guy. I always wanted to write compilers, not type systems as uh, Josh said. So uh, in the uh, 1998 I think there came the Sinclair ZX80. Anybody remember that? That's a computer with one kilobyte of memory and I said, I'm going to write a compiler for Pascal that runs on the ZX80. Uh, fortunately, I didn't really try very hard. Uh, one kilobyte is kind of, kind of constrained. Uh, but then I wrote one for uh, the Osborne one which came out afterwards which had I think a staggering 52 kilobytes of usable memory. 
And uh, not only wrote, did I write a, a compiler for Pascal, then I wrote one for Oberon. No, sorry, first for Modular 2. Then, after that was done, I went to Zurich to Niklas Wirt, and I did my PhD uh, under supervision, and I worked on Modular 2 and Oberon. So I'm one of these modular guys who uh, write colons between names and types, and that's uh, what you see in Scala as well. So now you know where it comes from. Uh, then in the 90s, I did a lot of function programming. Uh, uh, pretty theoretical lambda calculus, lots of popple papers and the stuff, but I was there at the beginning of Haskell. I wrote one of the first papers on type classes, uh, and I really like to use SML as well. OCaml didn't exist then yet. Uh, then in the 90s, I worked with Philip Wadler on a hacker's language called Pizza, which aimed at essentially putting functional programming features, which we all loved, into Java. Uh, the functional programming features were pattern matching and high order functions and generics. And that eventually led to uh, uh, generics. So we dropped the other things because uh, at the time the object oriented uh, mainstream wasn't really ready for that. And uh, that became Java C. And then afterwards I worked on something much more fundamental, essentially a minimalistic language and calculus that combined functional uh, programming with essentially a advanced notion of records that looked a little bit like SML modules. So that was functional nets and funnel. So the motivation of Scala then it was it grew out of this funnel language and uh, the main aim was to show that one could do a practical combination of object or functional programming. Because with funnel essentially we did the more theoretical, more purist, minimalistic thing before. Uh, what we dropped then was concurrency, which was relegated to the libraries, which I think was a very, very smart idea because nobody could have thought at the time about actors. I mean, maybe Joe Armstrong would have thought about actors, but certainly not me. And all the other cool concurrency features which we have now in Scala and we have essentially for free because they are libraries. We don't have to burn them into the language. Um, and also, there's unfortunately still no tight connection between a language and a core calculus, which we had in Funnel. So that's something that we hope to correct at some point in the future. What we added was a native ob object and class model, a good Java interop, and XML literals. I should hide behind, behind the podium now. <laughs> XML literals. Why did you add XML literals at the time? Well, I gave a number of explanations in the different talks, but uh, the real reason really was uh, that I wanted to have Scala to have a cool, uh, today one would say hipster syntax. So um, everybody uses square brackets for arrays, right? So we use round parents just for, to be different. Everybody uses angle brackets for types, so we use square brackets. Well, now we needed to find another use of the angle brackets. <laughs> So there you see where it came from. <laughs> Seriously, what makes Scala Scala? So Scala is a functional language uh, and it's also object oriented and modular. And I think it goes further than many other languages to actually try to really unify the two and not have them essentially different aspects of uh, a, a language that, that are not really, that are separate different separate sub-languages. It's also statically typed. It takes the types very seriously and it is strict. So that makes Scala different from Haskell. If I should compare it from the predecessors, I mean it was influenced by a lot of languages, but really probably the closest is OCaml. OCaml is an, uh, another language which is functional, has an object system, statically typed strict, so it has all these four uh, properties. Uh, the main difference between Scala and OCaml as I see them is that OCaml separates the object and module systems, so they're two different sub-languages, uh, sub whereas Scala unifies them. And Scala modules are objects and uh, Scala has the uh, type members, uh, which essentially are still a core aspect of modular programming and transport them into the objects. The other difference is that maybe probably because of that difference, OCaml can use Hindley-Milner, which is a very nice way to infer types, whereas Scala has full subtyping and has to use something slightly less powerful, namely local type inference. So that's sort of roughly uh, the design and uh, what 
crystallized out fairly soon was essentially two invariants that have stayed with us ever since. So the first invariance is to really take scalability seriously. And uh, one way to look at that is to say that instead of providing lots of features in the language, we want to have the right abstractions to have them provided in libraries. So if you compare, let's say, Scala's footprint, like just in, in number of constructs, number of keywords, numbers of syntax rules, with a lot of other languages, then it comes actually out as su a surprisingly small language. And it's because of that thing that we say, well, instead of adding primitives, we want to give you the right abstractions so that you can have them or the standard library would have them in, in, uh, in user provided code, in code that can be changed. And that has, I think, worked out quite well so far. There surely have been challenges, but overall it was positive. It implicitly trusts programmers and library designers to do the right thing or in, in, at least the community to sort things out. Because, of course, once you have the full power to essentially create your own syntax, so to speak, then that can also be abused. The second invariant is that it's really all about the types. So types, it's a statically typed language. It has a very powerful and flexible type system. So generally, uh, type systems uh, are rated in a sense on how safe they are, so how many things can be excluded by getting the types right, and then the other dimension is how flexible they are. Uh, so is a type system too constraining or can you um, essentially do, do, do is, it, is it like a suit that fits where you say, well, I'm, I'm sort of gently guided to do the right code, but it doesn't feel like, like uh, I, I can't do what I want to do. And of course the goals of programming language design is always to push the boundary out, to get more safety, to create more flexibility and ease of use. But one thing where Scala is a little bit different than the mainstream is that the trend in type systems has really been gone towards safety. And I mean that's, that's a very good development where I think now we have very powerful languages like Idris or Acta that uh, with, with, with dependent types and can, that can capture more and more properties in the type system even though sometimes it takes quite a lot of effort to get your program through the type checker or to make the type system work with the library abstractions you want to do. In Scala it was slightly different. So in Scala really the main goal was to say can we, or initially the main goal was can we have a type system that is good enough so that people who come from let's say Python or Ruby or other dynamically typed languages feel at home, don't feel too constrained. Uh, so we, we, were, we were sure that uh, a Ruby programmer would at the time not go back to Java, certainly not to pre-generics Java because it's just too painful. So that was essentially the main goal to have a type system that was acceptable for people who would otherwise have chosen a dynamic language. And uh, where I'd like it to move is essentially to catch up with the trend in type systems to push the safety but not uh, at the price of giving up the flexibility. So that's essentially the goal for the next years uh, in the, on, on the type side for Scala. Okay, so let's talk about the present. Uh, what's happened in the past year and uh, since the last Scala days in the community around Scala? Way too many things, of course, uh, that, that I could uh, cover them all or even do justice to the main ones. So I'll just give you some highlights. Uh, and it's a, it's a completely uh, uh, subjective selection of the things I want to talk about. So one thing that I think is quite stunning now is how many software packages are written in Scala, how many really powerful open source libraries are written from uh, Mesos, Akka, uh, uh, Spark, uh, Kafka, uh, SBT, Slick and so on and so on. So you really have an emergent ecosystem of stuff that runs on Scala and that's more and more interconnected. And on top of all these cool packages you have, of course, a lot of powerful applications uh, that make use of these. Uh, the other thing that has happened is that Scala is no longer essentially a single host language. It run, now runs essentially in two environments, on the JVM and on JavaScript. So Scala JS has essentially made huge progress over the last year, so much that in February 5, 2015, with the release of Scala JS 0.6, it's no longer experimental. So now essentially Scala JS is a grown up language. You can use it, people use it for production code. Uh, 
It's surprisingly good. It's really very, very fast. And with speed, I mean both the execution speed. Uh, in uh, quite a few benchmarks, ex actually, Scala.js beats native JavaScript, uh, which is quite remarkable. And it also deploys very, very fast. So a uh, couple seconds to actually have the turnaround from last uh, key edited to actually seeing the thing in the browser. And finally, it has, I think it got the balance just right to have types safety but also to have great interop with JavaScript libraries and that's something that is, is, a, is a touchy thing. Uh, it's, it's much, much simpler to map to JavaScript if you can just map all your host environment and everything. The challenge is to actually get the safety uh, and at the same time interop seamlessly with the JavaScript libraries out there. So why does Scala.js work so well? Well, I guess one big reason is really Sebastian Duran and the great people who contribute. So I really want to uh, have, have mentioned, mentioned them uh, for the wonderful work they did. Uh, technically, I guess the, reason, the other reason is that uh, the JavaScript really plays well to the strengths of Scala. When I said libraries instead of primitives, that means that it's actually very easy to just essentially ad absorb different libraries because Scala has all the glue, so to speak, to make them work in a seamless fashion. Uh, a flexible type system definitely also helps to be uh, in a new environment which is predominantly dynamic. And uh, the, the fact that Scala essentially grew up as a uh, essentially a embedded language in the JDK, so to speak, so it had to interoperate with, 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 with Java seamlessly. These, those genes also made it work really well with another host language, which is JavaScript. So I think that's sort of technically the reasons why uh, Scala.js is so good. Uh, we've seen lots of other tool improvements. Uh, the one thing I personally cared for most last year was that the incremental compiler got much, much better. So I have now my current project in Eclipse is maybe 50,000 lines. I have built on uh, save on. So essentially every time I do uh, command S, uh, the thing builds and I basically never wait. Uh, that's not that the compiler itself got so much smaller. It still takes its time to get, get the, through the 50,000 lines, but the incremental compiler is much, much better at actually predicting what's, what needs to be compiled and what can be left from the last one. Uh, I think we've also seen great progress in the IDEs. Uh, main IDEs, Eclipse and uh, IntelliJ, have both uh, made, made important improvements. And of course, there's also Enzyme, which uh, has gotten some new life over the last year. Uh, Enzyme <coughs> is the tool that makes essentially all the clever compiler logic available in your normal, uh, in your normal editor. So for uh, Scala IDE, uh, there's a big new version, version 4.0 that's available. Main highlights are, I think, a new debugger, uh, faster builds, and uh, using the new incremental compiler and the integrated Scala doc. Uh, the IntelliJ Scala plugin, I just want to have one highlight which I find really cool, and that's the implicit parameter highlighting. So if you have been puzzled by implicits that uh, somehow the search came up with the wrong one or it didn't come up with anything where you think it should have come up with something, so now you can find out. In, in IntelliJ, you have the complete history of the search and wh essentially what, what was found, which, which searches failed, and why. So, uh, so I think that's, that's a great thing to have and I hope that the uh, Scala IDE on Eclipse will uh, take a note of that and imitate it and, and follow, follow some point in the future. The other thing that uh, has happened or has, has matured are the online courses. Uh, we have a second course on reactive programming which came out last year in addition to the functional programming in Scala course. Both of the courses are available on the Coursera platform. And the reactive programming course is actually starting again very soon, April 13. This is the start date. So if you have some free time and want to get some really hard exercises on reactive programming, including at the end, I think we do a distributed key value store, uh, then uh, I can very much recommend that course. 
the stats are quite impressive. So, so far we have 400,000 inscriptions for these courses together. And uh, that comes with a success rate of 10%, which is actually pretty good. So 10% sounds ridiculously low, but uh, given the, uh, the world of online courses, it's actually twice as good than the, than the, than the industry average. So uh, that's, that's the stats here. The blue one, by the way, that was the first reactive course. So that, that, that was the top, and the other ones are the Scala courses. And that one is the new reactive course, the people who have already registered. So that's the present. Where are we going? Um, one thing that I have already mentioned when we have had all these yellow boxes, all the things that I think what we're seeing is uh, the emergence of a platform. Uh, we see core libraries that become more and more popular. Uh, uh, Spire or Escodec or many, many other of really cool libraries that will are used by more and more applications. We're seeing specifications that are uh, planned to have more than one implementation by multiple uh, organizations. Uh, for instance, the SIP uh, 15 on futures. Uh, that's essentially a common specification for futures in the Scala language. The SIP on reactive streams, uh, uh, the SIP on spores, I think all these things are specifications that can be implemented by more than one uh, provider. And we see the emergence of a common vocabulary. So I think these are really the beginning of a reactive platform. And the closest analog to that is really something that essentially happened with Java EE. Of course, this is not Java EE. This is a new age. So uh, it does something different. But the, the things that come together feel a little bit like that. So one thing that um, is a bit puzzling is to say, well, Java EE <coughs> is really essentially built around the JDK. The JDK is the core of Java EE. So the JDK is essentially given by its class files here. And uh, they are sort of the intermediate layer in which you map with Java C from Java source and from which you map to the native code of the processor you're running on. Well, I'm telling you nothing new here. You know that stuff. Um, so class files are really what is the specification of the JDK, or you could say the, the API. The rest is implementation. I mean, the JITs uh, improve every year, but the, the class files stay relatively constant. In Java 8, we, we've, we've seen an update, but they stay constant over multiple years. So what are class files good for? Well, uh, this is run once, uh, 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 compile once, run anywhere thing. So they make your software portable across hardware because different hardwares have implementations of the JDK and the JIT. They make, uh, give you portability across operating systems because you have standard libraries that have different implementations for these systems. They give you interoperability across versions. So old Java versions from 1996 can and the chances are good that they still run today. And they're the place where optimizations, analysis, instrumentation happens. So you could ask, what's the analog of the JDK for Scala? I could say, stupid question, the JDK is a JDK. Uh, Scala runs on the JDK, right? And that's true. So Scala runs on the same class files, augmented by what we call the Scala signatures, uh, compiled with Scala C. The Scala signatures are essentially a condensation of the symbol table of a compilation unit, and you need that for separate compilation so that the compiler can figure out what uh, these, these uh, things are. Oops. So now let's see what, aha. Uh -huh. Didn't want me to talk tech. Uh, okay. Oh, we just have to get this thing, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, so the signatures are condensations of the symbol table so that you, uh, the compiler can figure out what's in another compilation unit, what classes it defines, what methods it offers, and so on. So the challenges in this model for Scala are several. The first one is one thing that has been haunting us for a long, long time, and that's binary compatibility. 
So the point is that Scala C has way more transformations than Java C. And it's uh, not realistic to say 10 years ago when we first designed Scala, we knew everything we were doing down to the last bits. We should have known, but we're human. So it's, it's simply not true that you can't do that. So things, compilation schemes change, you find problems. For instance, we found a problem with uh, lazy valves that they can cause deadlocks and to, to fix that we would change the, have to change the compilation scheme for lazy valves in a binary incompatible fashion. So now you're between a rock and a hard place. Do you uh, fix the thing and make all code break or do you uh, keep, keep the, the uh, implementation stable for the sake of binary compatibility and uh, uh, live with the, with the problems. So that, that's something that is, is very annoying. The other reason or the other observation is that many implementation techniques in Scala use uh, are non-local. That means they require collaboration or co-compilation of a library and its client. The best known feature is that if you add, let's say, a method or a field to a trait, then you'll have to recompile the classes that implement that trait. So that is essentially this non-local thing that uh, you can't just upgrade a, a trait without also recompiling all the usages of that trait and you have, that of course constitutes a severe problem with binary compatibility. The second challenge uh, of essentially running on the JDK and having nothing else is that you have to pick which JDK. So the JDK that we, we lived in a, in, in, a, in a sense in a very anomalous situation where the Java platform, uh, the JDK, didn't really change for almost 10 years. So between uh, Java 5 and Java 8, uh, there weren't much changes and that was like 10 years and that was the 10 years essentially Scala came into existence. So Scala profited from this stability because there was only one JDK. In the future that will, that has already changed. So Java 8 is a radically different language than Java uh, 6 and 7 and we would like to make use of Java 8 of course in the Scala C compiler because we, we, we can get great performance improvements in doing so. But that would mean that suddenly all, not just our libraries, but all your artifacts, all your libraries have to choose do they run Java 8 only or Java 6. And that's a tough choice to make in particular for a library because with a library you don't know that's that you, you it's, it's not just being used in your organization. You don't know who your clients are and your clients most likely will be on Java 6 and some of them will be on Java 8 and you have the choice of uh, essentially losing half of your uh, audience or uh, having the latest technology. Not a nice choice to make. And I, that will most likely continue. I think Java 9 will add modules, Java 10 will add specializations which most likely will be a quantum leap just like the lambdas in Java 8 were. And of course there's now J JavaScript which is yet another platform. So you'll have to choose essentially on what JDK you want to run. So what we have been exploring and what I'm proposing here is to actually look into a Scala specific platform. So there would be a uh, for Scala specific format which is called Tasty. Uh, I'll explain what that means in a second. And Scala C would essentially compile into that and then uh, depending on what your platform is you would produce the JavaScript or the class files and that could be done both by the compiler by just having essentially a single tool pipeline like this or like this or you could actually pick up the uh, tasty trees which will be serialized and made persistent and do that only after the fact. So that was the idea. Uh, the core of this new platform is then uh, the tasty file format which is essentially serialized typed abstract syntax trees. So uh, for those of you who are not compiler buffs, so here, here's what a typed abstract syntax tree looks like. Uh, it, uh, the, oops. 
the, the, the tree is for this expression here, x plus 2. So uh, if you uh, analyze that, you say, well, that's, uh, we're Scala after all, so there's no plus node. We know that plus is a method call. So it's an apply, it's an application. The method gets applied to uh, an argument, a list of arguments, but the, the argument that matters here is the literal 2. And on the left here, uh, what we have is uh, a, uh, a selection, that's the x plus, and uh, the uh, left hand side of the selection is the x, so that's an ident, and the selection is the plus node. So those uh, nodes in black give you an abstract syntax tree. So that's essentially what the compiler sees when it compiles your programs. And the compiler sees more, at least after phase typer, it sees more. It sees also the types. So it knows that x is an int, select is a method from int to int. Uh, that thing is a constant, int, uh, an int constant, uh, and it knows that the value is 2, and that thing again is an int. So what we want to do is to say, well, let's take this. That essentially gives you all the information you have about the Scala program in a normalized and simplified form. Let's take that and make it persistent. Uh, so that's what we do. So what uh, uh, we have done is a, a file format for such trees, uh, which is a reference format for the analysis and transformation of Scala code. It's high level because it doesn't really go down to implementation details like how do I compile traits or anything else really. It's just the trees. Uh, it's complete, contains the types and uh, everything you need to know to have this thing running and it's quite detailed. So here's an example uh, of the tasty format for now not just this expression but a method that contains it. So it's plus 2x. Uh, int equals x plus 2. So uh, the, uh, the x plus 2 part would be this part here. So you see the apply node, you see the select node where it says, well, I have to essentially uh, select a method called dollar plus, which is our mangled name plus. And it also says, well, uh, there might be more than, uh, than one pluses, so I want the one from int to int. Uh, and then it says, well, on what do I run? Do I select the plus? And it says, well, it's, uh, here's a term ref direct 62. So it goes up and says, well, it's this parameter that I define here. That parameter is named x and itself, it has the type int uh, and the result type of the method is also int. So that is uh, it's just a quick rundown and to make you sense what these things look like. Uh, what's interesting is that these uh, trees compress rather well. So uh, it looks like these tasty trees take up about 25% of class file size, even though they carry, in a sense, much, much more information. Uh, but uh, it seems like this is quite feasible to actually simply add uh, the full uh, syntax tree, typed abstract syntax tree, to a, a class file. You could also ask, well, yeah, but where are the types? I mean, if I look at that thing, that looked like the black boxes, right? I don't see any types in here. Uh, and the, the answer is, well, actually, the types are essentially only stored at the leaves. So here's this term ref direct. It goes to the parameter. For the parameter, I notice what, what type it is. It is the int type in the Scala package. Uh, but uh, the, we have a very small type assigner that sort of recomputes the types of the trees. That's why we don't have to store them all and that's why the trees are relatively compact. So what can we do with it? And th that's actually something which uh, I find quite exciting because we can do a lot with it. So in the future, if you have, let's say, a tool that wants to do implement, uh, instrumentation of Scala programs or really any other uh, code transformation, so far your only choice was you do it in source. And that's tricky because then you have to know how to parse and to know how to parse you have to know how to build and to know how to build you have to sort of know what SPT is like and Gradle is like and Maven is like and so on. So that's, that's very hard. Or you use class files which uh, essentially are uh, everything, have everything you need for the execution. But of course that's a very low format. All the relevant Scala bits will be, will be ignored by that. Uh, that's for instance why tools such as FindBugs don't really work that well because uh, FindBugs essentially is uh, geared to uh, essentially um, 
there are certain compiler generated patterns in Scala programs that always trip up find bugs and so you get a lot of false negatives with that way. So it would be much simpler if you could just get the high level meaning without the implementation details. And that's precisely what these tools can do because they can just suck in these trees and make sense of them. Optimizations is, is another thing you can do. Fusion, inlining, everything. The trees are the ideal format for that. Code analysis, refactorings, the, the list goes on and on. So it's again for uh, the, and the for, for Scala, the, now the, the idea to publish once and run everywhere. Uh, you can run the same libraries on JS, JavaScript, or any versions of the JDK because essentially in the tool you only need to publish these tasty files and the rest can be done automatically. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is a bit more programming language researchy uh, because after all I'm, I'm a professor at EPFL uh, and working on essentially programming language research when I don't write compilers which is means not that often but still. Um, so um, what happens here I just wanted to give you a short overview. So the first one uh, I call connect the dots. Uh, so we have been working for, a, for a, quite a while actually already on uh, a calculus that essentially would give a solid foundation to what Scala is um, and to the essence of what Scala would be and that's called DOT. Uh, it's an ongoing work. Uh, the, uh, there's a paper in uh, full and there's a uh, slightly less ambitious but more complete paper in Uppsala. So the full paper essentially threw out a candidate. The Uppsala paper actually has a machine checked uh, soundness proof for a subset, uh, in a sense a subset of this system here. And what we will try now is essentially to get something like the full system back with a machine verified soundness proof. That's sort of our, our growl that we want to uh, achieve here. Um, and the other thing that I've been working on is uh, .c, uh, so the compiler, uh, which is actually not for the calculus but for a full version of Scala or I should say a slightly cleaned up version of Scala. Uh, that's part of the .e project, LAMP PFL .e project at GitHub. So dot, uh, here you see what that looks like and I don't, don't worry, I won't go into, into the details here. But essentially that's sort of the, uh, the gist of it. Do you say you have uh, four different forms of terms, so expressions, and then you have these types, top type, bottom type, you have intersections and unions, refinements and type selections. So as things go, it's actually fairly small. Uh, for a calculus, it's, it's already on, on the big side, but not terribly big side. So hopefully this is still manageable. And hopefully it is expressive enough to really make sense of essentially a lot of the core aspects of Scala. That thing here at the bottom is uh, reduction, so essentially that tells you how these terms are evaluated uh, in a store and things like that. Okay, so that was the dot calculus and we're continuing to work on that. Uh, the other work is more practical and that's essentially the compiler where the main um, motivation for the compiler is that we want to clean up some of the parts of Scala. So one thing I'm afraid to say, the uh, angle brackets have run their course so we will get rid of XML literals uh, or rather we will put them into uh, string interpolation like this so you will have, uh, have to write something like that and that will take care of the XML. The advantage like that uh, of that will be that it will be much, much simpler to actually have alternative libraries that make sense of these XML trees uh, because you don't really have a, a, the one and only implementation of XML in the language. Uh, procedure syntax, that goes nowhere so there's no replacement for that. Just write your equal signs. Um, Early initializers uh, was something that was sort of somewhat awkward because we had to do that to get rid of, uh, uh, to get around the problems that traits didn't have parameters and therefore uh, we had to sort of initialize them by overriding but then sometimes that came too late so things were initialized before, yeah, after they were used. So we invented the syntax of early initializers and uh, the, uh, hopefully the development here will be to say well just introduce trait parameters and uh, that will uh, essentially get rid of the problem at the root. 
So XML literals, procedures, and tags, and early initializers are on their way out. More simplifications. Uh, now, uh, those ones are a bit more fundamental. Uh, so I think Scala has too many types. Uh, I, and in particular, some of the uh, types are pretty hairy, in particular in the interactions between themselves. So the one thing I would get rid of uh, is existential types. Uh, and the other one is higher kind of types. I, sh I should tie it again behind the podium here. Um, uh, well, uh, the higher the reason for getting rid of both is that I think we can actually implement both by a, a simpler concept, and that's just types with uninstantiated type members. And to do that, we have to make essentially uh, serious use, and we have to take seriously an analogy uh, between parameters and members, which we have in many other parts of Scala, and which we have to essentially extend to the type system. So, what I mean by that is that we want to, of course, have type parameters. Oops, uh, that uh, yeah. Now, now we have to. That was a typo, uh, which sort of fell flat the slide. So. So what this should read, sorry, list of T in brackets, right? So think, I think of a T in brackets here. So that's a parameterized version. And what we want to expand that to internally in the compiler and in the conceptualization for the language is to say, well, that's actually a thing that doesn't have any parameter here. Uh, it's a thing that has essentially an abstract type member in the class. And I call the type list dollar t, which says you can't really directly access that. Uh, that has a mangled name, uh, so you won't be able to see that from from the user program. But we give you a type alias, which is t, which is private inside list. So inside the class list, I can still refer to the type t as I could uh, before. Okay, so you can. So that is sort of an interesting idea because it means that now. Uh, when we have uh, existential types, so uh, for instance, this uh, thing here, list uh, of t for some type t, or uh, simply the, with the wildcard syntax, list of underscore, what we can see that is what, what, what we can regard it at as is uh, this thing here. That we say, well, that's just list, right? Because after all, the class list is defined like this, it doesn't have parameters. We just didn't give you an instance of this type can do that perfectly well in current Scala already. You don't need to give an instantiation of a type variable. So it is a very nice explanation. And for a higher kind of type, again, we say, well, a higher kind of type is a type where you're still missing a type parameters. You still have to supply that, so it's exactly the same thing. It's just type list. To tell the truth, there's something we give up, namely kind checking, uh, but I think that's something worth giving up uh, for to get to gain this simplification, to gain the simplicity. So, so far though, so good, but so far I've only worked with classes. So there's another question here to say, well, what about if I have actually a type definition, like type two of t equals pair of t and t? What should that be? Now I can't say that's a class where I just haven't instantiated a type member. There's no class here. There's an alias. So what do I do with that? So then the idea is actually for these cases, we will create you a class. And that, that class is essentially a typed lambda, uh, uh, which, and the, don't worry, the typed lambda will have a surface syntax which is nicer than this one here. So the typed lambda, again, in our uh, view is to say, well, we won't have type parameters, so the argument of the lambda is a um, type. Uh, and again, it's mangled. It's, uh, uh, the name here says higher kinded argument. And then, then we say, well, well, yeah, but what's the body of the lambda? So what's the result of the lambda? So that's contained in a type uh, which is called apply. And the apply type then has essentially a pair of references to this higher kind of arc. Okay. So uh, what do we do then to, if we want to instantiate that, so to get the pair of, uh, to, to get the two of string is pair of string of string, how do we go about there? Well, what we do here is to say, well, okay, that's two. That's the one we have here. Instantiation with string is just saying, well, now my type parameter is string. And what we do then is to say, well, now we have essentially this two thing and we have to sort of implicitly apply it. So the compiler will do that. 
That's a cool idea originally due to uh, Adrian Morse, I think, and it is in this in this dot compiler and it actually works rather well. Other new concepts are uh, type unions and type intersections. Uh, they, uh, the intersections replace the compound types which we have so far, T with U, uh, and uh, they are uh, good for several reasons. One is uh, you w might have noticed that some of the least upper bound and greatest lower bound operations blow up. You probably all have seen this pages and pages of output of uh, if you mix types just right then essentially your uh, the least upper bound or the greatest lower bound will be very very large. Uh, it could actually be infinite but the compiler is smart enough to put a bound on that but it's not always intelligent enough to put the right bound on that. So so that's that's the problem. And even even putting a bound on that is sort of ad hoc and kludgy. So uh, having unions and intersections actually gets rid of that at the root. And they also make the type system cleaner and more regular. In particular with these things intersections and unions are actually commutative. Yay. That's what they should be. Uh, this one, this thing here is not commutative. So T with U is not the same as U with T because they are essentially mixed in composition. So we say right hand side overrides left hand side. Good. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, these things also pose new challenges for compilation. So you might have a thing like this. You might have a class uh, which defines a method X and that defines a method X differently. And then you have a value AB which is A or B, the union. And then you call AB dot X. So now you have the interesting question, well, which X should you call? Uh, you don't have a single definition that you can forward to. What you need to do is essentially have a hidden type test here to say, well, is it an A or is it a B? Fortunately, you can find out with in instance of tests. So the status is that the compiler for .c is close to completion and we hope to have an alpha release, so very shaky, don't look too hard at it, but uh, uh, by Scala Days Amsterdam. And we plan to use Tasty as the intermediate format and also to uh, Tasty for merging uh, .c and Scala C in the future. So the idea here would be we have a front end for .c, we have a front end for Scala C. Well, that's still uh, to be written, but uh, that uh, there the, are the plans to do that in the next months. And then they could both go to this common format and have a new backend, uh, which uh, could replace the old backend that we now have here. And at the code generation phase, we have again essentially the same code generator. That's the current code generator that's developed by the Scala team at TypeSafe for Java 8. So that's the plans here, how to how we want to merge the two developments, dot C and Scala C in a first step. Okay, so I'm almost done. So I just want to give you a couple more plans to say, well, now we have a cleaned up language, hopefully a new compiler to do. So now we want to add lots more stuff to it because we can, right? Well, um, I actually want to be very careful with that, but there are a couple of things where I think we, they're definitely worth exploring. So I just give you two where I think that, that it would be cool to have things like that. So the first thing is it would actually be nice to have implicits that compose because right now they don't really. So I explain like what, what I mean by that uh, in, uh, later on in this slide. So you know we already have implicit lambdas. So implicit x arrow t, that's just a closure, uh, a function from x to t, a value, uh, and the x is implicit in t. So more uh, typically you would use something like that, implicit transaction body, so if the body wants to get access to a transaction ID but you don't want to pass it everywhere, you make it an implicit and that's the thing you could pass to something like a transactional context that gives you the transaction and runs the body with that transaction. So what about if we also allow implicit function types? That looks logical, right? So we could actually have an implicit transaction error result as a type. Not just transaction error result, but now we say it's an implicit transaction error result. Okay, so the first thing we notice if we do that, then we can actually abstract over implicits. So we can actually tell, write another type, let's say transactional of R, and that's just this implicit transaction error R. So we can now give this type a name. Previously we couldn't because implicits were parts of methods and we couldn't abstract over methods. Okay, 
Uh, and furthermore, we can do, do, do that more than once, and that gives us composition. So one, uh, I, one uh, way to do it, for instance, if you did something else like that for I.O., then you could have a type transactional I.O. of R, and would, it would be transactional of I.O. of R. So you have just type application is composition. Okay, so now this is why, why this is cool. So the new rule uh, here would be that uh, the following, if the expected type of an expression E is an implicit function, then E, the expression, is automatically expanded to an implicit closure. So that means, for instance, if you have something like that, a function f and it returns a transactional of r and it's a body, then that would expand to this thing here. So the same function, but now the body, in order to be a transactional, you have to be an implicit function. Uh, so the compiler would actually generate one. It would just say, well, make an implicit closure with an unnamed parameter and the type that's given here and uh, the body. Now, you, I, I say, well, how do I get that the parameter when it's unnamed? Well, there's implicitly, of course. So the implicitly method will actually pull these things out and let you use that in the body. That's the only rule we need, and it's rather, it's rather small, and it's actually pretty logical to do that. And with that, we can actually get implicits that compose. The second thing, and it, that essentially the composed, composing implicits are sort of lead into this thing is to uh, have a better treatment for effects. So, so far, purity in Scala is by convention, not by coercion. That means you can be as impure as you like, but it's generally considered bad style to do so, and it's considered good style to be pure. Uh, in that sense, Scala is not really a pure functional language. Some, some people would say, well, Scala is not a functional language at all because it's not pure, but I find that a bit extremist. Um, so let's settle on the fact that it's not a pure functional language. Uh, and that's something that we might be able or we might want to correct some point at some point in the future. So we'd like to explore scalarly ways to express effects of functions. Uh, so effects, the things we want to express here, they can actually be quite varied. Uh, Typical effect is mu mutator var, so state mutation is an effect. I.O. is an effect. Uh, exceptions, throwing ex exceptions is generally considered an effect. I think even dereferencing nulls is, can be considered an effect. So what are effects then? I think they are two essential properties that, that characterize them. The first thing is they're additive. So that means that if you have one effect and the other effect, then you have both effects and the order doesn't matter. It's just a set, right? So you have a set of possible effects that you have. And the second property is these sets propagate along the call graph. That means if I call you and you have this effect, then I indirectly have the same effect because I called you. Right? So I think with these things, these systems with, with these two properties, I would call, say, can be called effects. Now, going back to Haskellator, Haskellator, of course, says, though shalt use monads for effects. And in fact, monads are cool. Uh, but for Scala, I hope that we can find something even better. The first problem with monads is they don't commute. So uh, if I have an effect of A and an effect of B, for if I transpose them into monads, then that's not the same as having an effect of B and an effect of A. There's an order which is quite artificial that monad compositions impose on us here. Uh, so to get composition, good composition, I require, it, we require so-called monad transformers. That's the state of the art in systems where, where monads are used to describe effects. And I tried to wrap my head around that, but then it exploded. So, so the idea here would be to use implicits to model effects as capabilities. And I just give, throw one slide and then I'm done. So. That's sort of a, an effect declaration that you would find in Java. So you have a return type and then you say, well, it throws an exception. Instead of this, uh, we could potentially use this to say, well, instead of declaring I throw an exception, I say, no, no, I need the capability to throw an exception. If I don't have the capability, I can't do that. So, and capabilities we can actually model quite nicely with implicits. So we can say def f implicit t can throw exception, so that's what I need, and I return r. 
Okay, so now we just have no learned how to abstract on implicits. So we could actually do that and add this nifty little declaration that we say we have a type throws and it takes a result type and an exception and it's an implicit function from can throw exception to R. And if we do that, then we can actually get back to this. That's precisely the definition. He now throws seen as an infix type that will expand to that. So we can actually use the same essentially effect denotations, but essentially map this to something we understand very well, which is part of our type system and which is composable. So that's sort of the, 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 the idea here what we might be able to do. So in summary, Scala is I think uh, a language that over the last 10, 11 years has played quite an important role because I think it helped, definitely helped to establish functional programming in the mainstream and it also showed that a fusion of functional and object oriented programming is both possible and useful. I like to think that it also helped a little bit in the adoption of strong static typing when definitely when we started Scala dynamic languages were all the rage and type languages were out in the desert and I think I was sort of uh, a, a new breed of languages of which Scala was one and I guess F sharp was another have actually rectified this picture a little bit and the other overwhelming thing really is how many enthusiastic users Scala has, con conference attendees included. Uh, so uh, I'm really blown away by that. Our aims in the future is to make the platform more powerful, make the language simpler and work on foundations to get to the essence of Scala. Let's continue to work together on this. Thank you. I think sh should we have some have some questions? Yeah, I think we could. There's yeah, so there, there's two microphones here for anyone who'd like to ask a question. Um, if the microphone's behind you, um, well, it, it's behind you, but they're right here. <laughs> One of the things you talked about was cleaning up uh, the syntax and for type inference it works from left to right and sometimes uh, you know type uh, list takes an A that descends from some other type or uh, the view of another type and it doesn't work right. The type inferencer messes up and so one of the suggestions or one, one work around is to make an implicit parameter at the end. It's pretty difficult to understand for newbies. Um, and it looks messy in your code. Did you have any ideas for cleaning that up or is it possible to clean that up? Uh, yeah. Um, generally I think uh, that ‑‑ so I think we, we have to distinguish between what's messy or sometimes in code that people see that other people write or other people have to write to get this functionality and what's messy in terms of language rules. So I, I would argue that this, this very fact is actually an example where the language itself is perfectly squeaky clean because it didn't, didn't really have to do anything particular about that. Implicit resolution solves all these other problems as well. Uh, I think the problem you're referring to is uh, uh, something that um, there, there was a paper on generalized type constraints that would handle that in the syntax by I think Kennedy and uh, was it done sign 2004 Upsla? But that sort of requires essentially another set of hoops that the language has to jump through. And I've sort of come up, come to the conclusion that in the type system you have to be super, super careful with these things because it's very, very likely that a single feature addition will make everything twice as complex. So these, that essentially feature interaction means the whole thing grows exponentially. Um, for implicits, uh, I think there, there, we, there, there are some, some straw man proposals out there. So once one um, annoying thing with implicits is that the implicit always has to come last. 
And why does it have to come last? Well, because if you want to pass an explicit argument, then it has exactly the same syntax. You just write it in parents. So to disambiguate, it has to come last. Uh, and that's actually quite constraining also for, for situations like sometimes the, like, like the one you mentioned. So there was an idea to actually give special syntax to explicit implicit arguments so that we can drop this restriction and avoid quite a few puzzlers that uh, uh, are in the, in the puzzlers book related to that. Hey, uh, do you see completely replacing uh, generics with uh, dependent types or are they both going to be supported or is one more powerful than the other? Yeah, so they're definitely both going to be supported. So this, and the surface syntax will be exactly what you see now. Uh, but uh, the uh, genericity can be mapped into dependent types. And that's the thing that the compiler does. Uh, .c compiler does that already. So if it sees a parameterized type, it will immediately say, well, that really means the other type. So from now on, I will just use the dependent type. And that has a lot of advantages, in particular in corner cases. So uh, straightforward gener generics is well understood and simple. But if you add it uh, with, let's say, wildcard arguments, which both Java and Scala do, then you get some very hairy cases. There are some papers by Russ Tate that appeared in PLDI that essentially explore all the possibilities and I can tell you it's not pretty. So there are a lot of dark corners in there. And by saying, well, we immediately map into this other thing which is also well understood, namely dependent types, we avoid all these problems of interference. So that's the main, main advantage of doing that. But for the, for the surface syntax, it's exactly the same. Uh, so in the current world of Scala on the JDK, uh, distribution of Scala libraries is often done as jars analogously to how Java libraries are distributed. Uh, in this future world of this intermediate representation of type trees, uh, how do you foresee Scala libraries being distributed? Um, well, I, I guess right now the attitude is a bit wait and see. I mean, uh, as, as you know, uh, in Java 9, there's actually planned to have new mechanisms. Uh, the, the Jigsaw project is maybe finally coming to fruition. And I think we should see what, what happens there. And if at all possible, we use the same things. Because I think in the terms of deploying libraries, we uh, it, it worked really well to use the same proven old JDK mechanisms. So what I would propose is that the new parts, the tasty parts, will just be kept as attributes in the class files, just like we do the simple, simple table information now. Thank you. Okay. Um, with the um, possibility of uh, using implicits um, to provide a marker capability, um, or it unlock capability for side effects. Um, have you thought about the advantages of using uh, basically one container type to kind of grab all of these things and then have an intersection type inside that which gives you all the capability versus having a bunch of independence because it seems like there are tricky issues about, you know, what exactly is a duplicate and what is not and I, I ‑‑ yeah. Have not yet wrapped my head around how uh, to start that out. Neither have I, but I think that, that that's really very, very good things to explore. So we haven't really thought that far yet, but but I think something like that would definitely be be a good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all, and I think there's a there's a reception down in the hall, and I'm happy to chat with everyone. Uh, okay.